Coming up on this Thursday edition of Newsline at noon, a US think tank says North Korea has completed the expansion of its main rocket launch site and could fire a new missile before the end of this year. With pro-democracy demonstrators threatening to occupy government buildings in Hong Kong, China's foreign minister warns against any illegal protests and says foreign countries should stop meddling in China's domestic affairs. Plus, it's Korea versus Korea this evening as the South play the North for the gold medal in the men's football at the Incheon Asian Games. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Thursday, October 2nd here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. And we start this afternoon with news that North Korea has more than likely upgraded one of its major rocket launching stations. Right. There's also compelling evidence suggesting Pyongyang recently conducted another engine test of the rocket motor used in its intercontinental ballistic missile KN-08. Chi Myung Gil has more. U.S.-based think tank 38 North says satellite imagery shows the missile's first stage engine was tested in mid-August at the Sohe launch site in North Korea's northwestern Dongchangni region. This adds to a series of engine tests Pyongyang has carried out since 2013. It remains unclear how successful these tests have been, though. Security expert Joel Witt, who runs a 38 North website at John Hopkins University, says North Korea could be moving on to full-scale tests of the KN-08 because these kind of engine tests are normally stepping stones to that end. The missile is believed to have a range of at least 5,500 kilometers, which means the U.S. state of Alaska is within its range. North Korea is not only testing engines either. It has also completed a major program to upgrade the Sohe satellite launching station that began late last year. A gantry tower was raised to 55 meters by adding three new platforms to handle up to 50 meter long rockets. The existing launch pad has been upgraded to launch rockets even larger than the Unha 3 North Korea sent into space in late 2012. With the completion of the engine test, 38 North says Pyongyang may decide to test fire another rocket before the year is out. A new, even larger rocket than the Unha 3 is also reportedly under development, but the website says it'll be several years before it's fully operational. Jim Young Gil, Arirang News. Russia says the multilateral talks on North Korea's nuclear program may resume at some point in the future, but would take quite a lot of time. Meeting with its visiting North Korean counterpart in Moscow on Wednesday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said resuming the so-called six-party talks, which have been dormant for six years now, would be complicated but not hopeless. The Russian official added unsettled issues could negatively impact relations between the two Koreas and pose a threat to regional stability. Lavrov also called on all related parties in the dialogue to take a balanced approach and refrain from taking abrupt steps that polarize positions. The two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia began the six-party talks in 2003 with the aim of denuclearizing Pyongyang, but they were suspended in 2008 after North Korea launched a ballistic missile. The floor leader of Korea's main opposition party has stepped down from her post after just five months at the helm. Now her resignation follows controversy over a special bill aimed at uncovering the truth about April's ferry disaster. In an email sent to all party members of the New Politics Alliance for Democracy this morning, Pa Young sun said, it was with a heavy heart that she was resigning. She said she had gone through a difficult time as a floor leader, having to give up her beliefs, honor and pride in the name of responsibility, and that now she was laying down that burden. Pak also urged the swift passage of the Seodo bill and the establishment of a special investigative team for the tragic accident. 
Pak's resignation comes two days after the ruling party and the main opposition party reached a compromise on this controversial bill. Now, with their standoff now behind them, rival party lawmakers will meet again this Thursday afternoon for a plenary session where they will decide on which government offices will be subject to annual parliamentary audits and finally sign off on last year's fiscal budget. With the annual audit of the government slated to start next Tuesday, standing committees have been narrowing down the list of government officials they will call in for questioning. As for the 2013 government fiscal budget, it was supposed to be passed by the end of August, but the partisan dispute over the special Herald of Ferry bill delayed it. Turning now to the latest prospects of a meeting between South Korean President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, Korea's foreign minister invoked some weather terms to describe the probability of the leaders holding their first one-on-one -on -one meeting within the next few months as cloudy, he said. But there was a chance for sun, but only if Tokyo sincerely admits to and atones for its historical wrongdoings to Korea. Uh, Hwang sang -hee reports. The forecast for a summit between President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe this year is cloudy. In an interview with Korean radio station CBS on Wednesday, Foreign Minister Yoon byung has said a show of Japanese sincerity over historical issues remains a precondition to summit talks. He added that resolving the urgent issue of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women would be a good place to start. Yoon said measures that can be accepted by the 55 former sex slaves still alive and the international community would be regarded as measures of sincerity. His remarks follow a string of meetings between the two countries this month. Yoon held private talks with Japanese ambassador to Korea Koro Betsho for the first time, while President Park welcomed former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori, who brought a personal letter from Abe. The vice foreign ministers from Korea and Japan met in Tokyo Wednesday for their first strategic dialogue since President Park took office in February of 2013. The frequent diplomatic exchanges raised speculation that the two neighbors were preparing for what would be the first summit between their leaders, with November's APEC summit in Beijing as the likely stage. But President Park remains adamant she will not meet with Abe until he apologizes for Tokyo's wartime atrocities. As the two sides remain wide apart on the comfort women issue, the Korean foreign minister said it will likely be some time before the sun shines again. Hwang sang -hee, Arirang News. So as we heard there in sang -hee's report, even all these decades later, the Korean victims of Japan's system of wartime sex slavery are still awaiting a proper apology from the Japanese government to raise awareness of this very emotive issue. These now very elderly women have been holding rallies every week for the past 20 plus years in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. Usually the routine is the same, but this week they were joined by some very special and supportive guests. Kwon Soa reports. In front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul at a weekly Wednesday gathering dedicated to the women who were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II, Japanese Christians join in. As a Japanese citizen, I want to sincerely apologize for the violation of your dignity and human rights. I want to apologize to the victims of sexual slavery and for the unresolved pain it caused. I am so very sorry. The surviving victims thanked them for coming and said it was the Japanese government that was at fault, not the Japanese people. When you go back to Japan, please tell Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to stop making these absurd remarks. I hope the truth is spread to more people so that we can find peace before we die. While the Japanese pastor's heartfelt gesture shows that there are ordinary Japanese citizens who are ashamed of the atrocities that were carried out by their country in the past, Tokyo continues to turn a deaf ear to the demands of the victims. On the same day, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said the sexual slavery issue needed to be revised in school textbooks, another sign that the Japanese government is trying to whitewash history. 
But he added that he has no plans to make changes to the 1993 Kono Statement, a landmark apology to the victims of wartime sexual enslavement, or publish a new one. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, the ever-growing appeal of exploring the great outdoors here in Korea and feeling as one with nature has been a boon for business here in the country. Total sales of outdoor gear are projected to top 7.5 billion US dollars this year. That means sales will have doubled in the space of just three years. Industry experts attribute the rapid, rapid growth rather to the increasing number of people taking up uh, outdoor activities and also the availability of much more fashionable outdoor apparel. They say some people are now choosing to incorporate their hiking and camping clothing actually into their everyday wardrobes because they're being designed exactly with that purpose in mind. Pressure is mounting and patience thinning over the pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong. For a closer look at this and other global stories, we connect live to our Eunice Kim at the News Center. Eunice, student leaders are now threatening to occupy government buildings in Hong Kong if one of their demands is not met in the coming hours. That's right, Mark. The ultimatum is directed at Hong Kong's embattled chief executive, step down or we storm in, effectively raising the stakes on what ultimately has been a waiting game. China is also closely monitoring the developments in one of its biggest political challenges unraveling on the world stage. Our Kim min -ji has this report. Pro-democracy protesters have warned of further action if Hong Kong's chief executive does not step down by Thursday evening. Massive crowds entered a standoff with police as they rallied outside CY Leung's office gates overnight. Protesters say they will occupy government buildings if their demands aren't met. They also want universal suffrage in Hong Kong's 2017 elections and for Beijing to abandon its plan to vet candidates for the post of chief executive. Uh, I don't know how long, but I think that every Hong Kongers may, uh, will spend all their efforts to achieve what they want and voice out their opinion until the government gets action and respond our needs. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry at a joint press conference with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Washington called on Hong Kong authorities to exercise restraint in the face of protests. Wang was curt in his response. The Chinese government has very firmly and clearly stated its position. Hong Kong affairs are China's internal affairs. All countries should respect China's sovereignty. Wang added that illegal acts that violate public order would not be tolerated in any society. If protesters follow through on their pledge to storm government buildings, there are mounting fears of violent clashes. China's official state newspaper, The People's Daily, warned of unimaginable consequences should the protests persist, while state-run television in Hong Kong said residents should support their local authorities who are only trying to restore social order as soon as possible. Kim min Arirang News. The director of Dallas County's health department says a second person is being monitored for an Ebola infection in the United States, a person who had close contact with Thomas Eric Duncan. Now, he's a man the CDC confirmed as America's first Ebola diagnosis yesterday. Federal health officials have been tracking people who came in contact with Duncan during the days he showed symptoms, which is when Ebola becomes contagious. Duncan was reportedly not sick during during his flight from Liberia to Dallas last month, but when he did fall ill a few days later, the local hospital he checked into released him with antibiotics, even though he had informed staff of his recent trip to Liberia. Duncan is said to be in better condition from critical to serious since being placed in isolation on Sunday. 
And finally, the volcanic eruption of Japan's Mount Ontake has now claimed the deadliest toll in 90 years. Nagano police said the death toll from Saturday's blast rose to 47 as rescue workers resumed their search Wednesday despite the risk of another blast. Some 1,000 troops, police, and firefighters wore surgical masks and carried toxicity measuring devices as they canvassed the volcano amid ash and gas spewing from the crater. Helicopters brought bodies down the three-kilometer high peak. Special cutting machines were used to free bodies stuck between rocks. Others were found buried in ash. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. Even when I'm Ah Jin Ju, market researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about. It's not often we get a chance to ride on a military helicopter or a tank, but there's an event currently taking place where you can. An annual festival running in Korea's central Chungcheong Namdo province gives regular folks like us a taste of what it's like to be a soldier in the South Korean military. Kim Hyun Bin has the story. Since all able bodied men in Korea are required to serve in the military, they are well aware of what it's like to live as a cadet day in and day out. But that leaves a large segment of the population, women and children included, that aren't. To enhance understanding, the Army headquarters opened the 12th Ground Forces Festival in Kaeryong City this week under the theme, An Army That Connects With The People. The Ground Forces Festival is the country's largest military fair. It offers visitors a chance to see, hear and experience all aspects of the Army. There are 51 events people can take part in. People can get in the cockpit of an attack helicopter or inside tanks, in addition to many other hands-on activities. One of the most popular sections is a shooting range, where people can fire off a real rifle using blank rounds. Special military performances and stunts are also scheduled throughout the day. All men must go to the army and get to experience this, but women cannot. Through this festival, we can get a glimpse of what soldiers go through. It was fun. Those that have gone so far have enjoyed the experience. My kids are curious about the life of military personnel and they wanted to ride on the helicopter and tanks. They had the chance to do so and loved it. I would like to give my sincere gratitude to the army, the Ministry of National Defense and all the soldiers helping out. There's also a boot camp arena where one can test their might and agility. The mock towers, which are used for parachute training, are another popular attraction, where people can jump from a height of 11 meters. The festival runs through this Sunday, October 5th. Kim Abin, Arirang News, Kaerong City. Right, well, if you prefer your festivals a lot less extreme and hands-on, well, we've got some good news for you because it's that time of the year again. When the eyes of Asia's movie-making industry settle on a city in southern Korea, the 19th edition of the Busan International Film Festival opens with a very grand ceremony on this Thursday evening. It's going to run for roughly one week and a half and feature hundreds of movies and documentaries from all around the world. Park Ji-won reports. Preparations are ongoing at the Busan Cinema Center, the main venue of the annual film festival, to greet dozens of film stars and film lovers from all over the world. Now in its 19th installment, this year's Busan International Film Festival opens this Thursday evening. 314 films from nearly 80 countries will be shown at seven theaters in this southern harbor city throughout the 10-day event. To celebrate this year's grand opening, an Eve celebration took place Wednesday at Biff Square in Namporong, the birthplace of the festival back in 1996. I sincerely congratulate the opening of the 19th BIFF. Please support our film, the tenor Lyrico Spinto. I came to celebrate the opening of the Busan International Film Festival. I'm very happy to be here. As a Busan resident, I'm proud to see this international film festival being held in the city, and I wish it many more successful years to come. 
Taiwanese film director Tu Jie News international premiere, Paradise in Service, will open the festival. Hong Kong director Yi Po Chung's comedy and melodrama Gangster Payday will be the festival's closing film. Park Ji Won, Arirang News, Busan. Yeah, the curtain is starting to come down on this year's Asian Games in Incheon. Only two full days remain, but that's not to say there isn't plenty of sporting action left to enjoy. Lots to enjoy, and we're going to start today's coverage with South Korea's silver in the women-only sport of rhythmic gymnastics. Joining us for this story and more is our very own Song Ji Sun, who's been following the games for us. Hi, Ji Sun. Good afternoon, guys. And actually, the first gold silver in women's rhythmic gymnastics for the Korean team, and they missed the podium last time in Guangzhou four years ago, but this time they earned the first silver in the women's gymnastics team event. Now, this, uh, this achievement was made possible mostly because of the country's gymnastics stars, Hun Yan Jae, who contributed tremendously in achieving the score. She exercised a clean-looking routine in all four routines of clubs, hoops, and the list of two, leading all the siblings to score 71.732 points in the team final. The team made up of four gymnasts performs 12 routines, with the top 10 scores added up as the team final score. South Korea was placed second for the first time at the ASEAN, with slightly over 164 points, six points behind Uzbekistan, who took the gold. The bronze medal went to Kazakhstan. The top 24 players get their seat for the individual finals tonight from adding up a top three score from the four routines performed at last night's events. And at this year's ASEA, 16 players will take part. So his medal chances at the individual final have improved as hard Chinese rival Dong Xin Yue is feeling under the weather, telling reporters she caught a cold after flying straight into Korea from the World Championships last week. Well, it's certainly a very impressive sport to watch, isn't it, on mm -hmm. TV, how they can throw the ball so high in the air and catch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they look really uh, nice as well, very graceful. Uh, North Korea's women's football team won the gold. Tell us about that. Right, another history made there because um, North Korea is placed 11th in FIFA rankings, whereas Japan is placed third. And North Korea beat Japan in a very convincing victory of 3-1 last night in the team final. And it was Kim Eun-mi, Yumi, Ralin Shim and Ho Eun-byo who scored one goal each to give their country their third Asian Games title and exacting sporting revenge on Japan, who beat them in the final at Guangzhou 2010. And speaking after this game, North Korean team coach Kim Kang min thanked North Korean leader Kim Jong-un for their victory. The coach said the team was thankful for his, quote, support and action from the leader. The North Korean coach then added that he had hoped for an all-Korean final, and he also praised the South Korean fans for cheering for them at the stadium. South Korea won the bronze, beating Vietnam 3-0 earlier to take the bronze for the second straight time. Mm -hmm. It was really good to see both Koreas, the team, uh, both Korean teams getting together at the podium and taking pictures yeah. with one another yeah. and smiling, congratulating each other for their victory and for the bronze for South Korea as well. So, Chisan, tell us about the events that are scheduled for today. Well, I'm sure a lot of male and female fans of Soo Hyun-jae will once again tune in to watch her final at the individual all-around, which will start at 6 p.m. tonight. And of course, she will play her four routines again tonight, the same um, procedures. And after qualifying first at the preliminary yesterday, she will repeat her routines at 6 p.m. Korea time. Now look out for some more golden kick actions in Taekwondo as well, because we have four finals coming up for four different weight categories, two for men and two for women. And coming after that, at quarter to 8 p.m. tonight is what I think is one of the most exciting events you can watch at a major sporting event, which is the men's 4x100 meter relay. We must also not forget the historic inter-Korean football match final tonight. That is the men's event. And this is the first time in 36 years that the two Koreas have played each other at the football final. And the two sides will obviously be very fierce to get the golden title because that will be the first in a very long time. 28 years for the south side and 36 for the north. Wow. Wow, yes. <laughs> wow, indeed. And uh, yeah, let's hope it's an exciting match, Ji Sun. Uh, thoroughly looking forward to it. Lots mm -hmm. of Koreans on both sides of the border will be watching. Right. And uh, let's hope for a good result uh, for either team, really. Okay, Ji Sun, thanks ever so much for your report throughout the Asian Games. Thank you.
We had sudden passing showers in Seoul earlier in the day, and as we can see, the rain clouds are moving into the nation. And uh, between 5 and 30 millimeters of precipitation is expected, so we won't be getting much rain. But as we all know, autumn rain will trigger cooler air, so temperatures will only make it to low 20s in many areas. On that note, here are the readings for today. Now, the high in the capital will only rise to 20, while Gwangju and Busan will peak at 25 degrees Celsius later on. Now, for other regions, it looks like Jeju Island and Daejeon Island will see highs of 24 and 23 respectively. And in Incheon, where the Asian Games are in full swing, it will be a rainy and cool day with a high of 20. And tomorrow is Friday and also National Foundation Day of Korea, which is a national holiday. And the weather should cooperate with any plans that you have. Mostly to partly sunny skies will be featured on under mild conditions. That's all for now. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you, Chian, for the weather update. And that does it for this edition of Newsline at Noon. Yes, Friday is National Foundation Day here in Korea, as Jihan just mentioned. So Jinju and I will be back at the same time on Monday. Until then, goodbye.